Thank you for that wonderful singing. Thank you, choir, for that special number. Really appreciate that very, very, very much. Please turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 6, if you're not there already. Ephesians chapter 6 this morning and looking at verses 10 through 17. 10 through 17 this morning. I have been excited about what the pastor, what our pastor Scheip has been speaking about for about the past month. And just hearing the messages and hearing how the Lord has placed uh, equipping the saints for the work of the ministry on his heart in a special way. And I'm, I've been excited about that. I'm excited to walk beside him in obedience to that um, as well as we go forward in that process. Excited for some of these new things that, that, that he is looking to put in place and I'll be right there beside him to help. Um, but that's really what this message has been born out of, just, the, it, just as he's been preaching through that, equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. And I was thinking as, as he uh, asked me to speak uh, today, I, I just got to thinking, like, what, what, is our, you know, what is our church going through here? And I, and, and I am just excited to be a part of this church body who is, and this church family who's willing to walk forward in obedience to the scriptures and what the Lord has called us to do. And I got to thinking about Ephesians chapter yeah, well, really, the whole book of Ephesians. And in the first three chapters, how the Apostle Paul lays out a lot of doctrine and how he gives us things that happen, how we are blessed whenever we come to know Jesus Christ as our Savior. We are given new life in Christ. We are adopted into the family of God. We are forgiven and redeemed, and we are, se and, and we are sealed with the Holy Spirit, just to name a few. These are just doctrines that the Apostle Paul lays out for us whenever we become children of God and enter into the family of God. And then he takes the next couple of chapters, 4 through 6, to really lay out some very practical ways in order for us to, uh, to, to live out the Christian life. He starts in chapter 4 uh, with saying, we need now to walk worthy of the calling to which we have been called. That's the calling. All those blessings that the Lord gives us in chapters 1 through 3, that's the calling. And then he says, now walk worthy of those blessings. You've been given them already. Now walk worthy of them. And, and, and basically walk in a manner, walk in close fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. These flies are crazy. Um, and he, 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 uh, he gives us some, some very practical ways to do that. We're to walk in humility and unity. And we're to put off the old man and put on the new. We're to walk in love. And we're to walk in wisdom and not in foolishness. As wives, wives are to submit themselves and be respectful to their husbands. Husbands, we are to love our wives as Christ loves the church. Children are to obey their parents. And what pastor has been speaking about for about the past month, we are to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. All this is laid out all through the book of Ephesians. And this last thing, this is how Paul wraps up the book. He wraps up the book of Ephesians, and we come to it in chapter 6. This is the final thing that he brings to the Ephesian people and to you and me. And he starts off by saying, and, and uh, well, really, I'll just give you the, the whole message here, here in just one, and then we'll break it down a little bit. He's going to talk about how if we do this, if you do this personally, if you do, and, and if we do this as a church body, here's what will happen, and we must not be surprised by it, that somebody will notice, and that somebody is the one who we call Satan. He will notice, and we must not be surprised when he notices, and he will bring the fight to us. We will be in the battle a lot. He's going to bring it. We don't have to go look for it. All we have to do is live our lives in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. All we have to do is live our lives that uplift his name and bring him glory Satan's going to notice because there's no one more interested in bringing the name of God low and defaming the name of God and using you and I to do it. There's no one more interested in doing that than Satan himself. And that's what Paul is going to point out here. And he says right here as we start this in verse number 10, he says, finally, after he's laid out everything, after he's laid out all these truths, he says, finally, in other words, here's, here's the last thing, finally, be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. He recognized more than anybody that when this battle comes, and it will come, when this battle comes, you and I are powerless to stand against it as we stand in our own strength. We are powerless to stand against it. Our only hope 
is to be strong in the Lord. And God has given us the resources that to, for, for, for us to do just that. And there's more than, just, than, than what we're going to talk about today. We're only going to talk about one of those resources. This message is all about standing strong in the Lord and putting on the armor of God. That's what we have to do as Christians in the strength of the Lord. And we must be strong in the Lord and put the armor of God on. Right before we get into this, let's just close for, or let's just bow our heads for a word of prayer. And then we'll jump into the text. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you, and dear Lord, I just want to ask you one more time, as I've asked so many times, that you would now just allow me to speak with words that are from you, with words that are very understanding. And dear Lord, I want to ask that you would teach us new things from your word today. I want to ask that you would encourage us. I pray no one would go from here discouraged, but encouraged to be strong in you, to be strong in you and in the power of your might to walk forward in that way and not in our own strength. Father, give us wisdom now as we look at your word. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Verse number 10, we, look, look right there in verse number 10. He, uh, let's just read it again. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. What Paul means here is not complicated. He's simply saying as a regular habit of life, in everything that you do, not just when the battle comes, but in everything that you do, do all in the strength of God and not in your own strength. It's a very simple truth. And by the way, it's implied here very much in this text that be strong in the Lord. It, like, like in other words, do it right now. Do it right now. Don't wait for the fight to come to you. Don't, don't wait till Satan is standing on your doorstep to strengthen yourself in the Lord. By then it is way too late. Be strong, strengthen yourself in the Lord right now. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And by the way, could, could, could I get uh, the, yeah, would you mind just going through the slides here for me? Um, so, so we can uh, keep going here. Thank you very, very much. We are to be strong in the Lord. We can do nothing apart from ourselves. John 15 verse 5 says this, and this is Jesus talking. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. It's so important that I depend on the strength of God to empower me when Satan attacks. I must be strong in the Lord. Now, skip down to, to verse 12. We'll go back to verse 11 here in a minute. But look at verse 12 with me here for a second. And the, and the Apostle Paul says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. It's very important that we understand as we enter into this battle who our foe is and that we never lose sight of who he is and that we never get that 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 we never get fooled into thinking it's anyone other than who it truly is and he says in verse 12 for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against the rulers against the authorities against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places now for just for sake of time let me just Put that in layman's terms and tell you exactly what he's saying there. He's saying your foe is Satan and his demonic forces. That is who your foe is. And we can lose sight of that so quickly sometimes. By the way, I just want to say this. Make no mistake about what Paul is saying. Here, here's, here's what Paul is not saying. When he says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, he is not saying that we will never have conflict with other people. He's also not saying that... that yeah, that I will never struggle with my sinful flesh, with my old man. He's not saying those two things. As you read the writings of Paul, you can see that very, you, you, it, it doesn't take you long to see, uh, to see that, uh, that he had tons of conflict with all kinds of different people, especially ones that were opposing what he was trying to do. You can also read, there's a portion of scripture where Paul talks about how he struggled with his own flesh. <laughs> and he says very, very plainly, the things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, what's he say? I do him. So he struggled with his own flesh. Okay, so that's not what he's saying here. What he is saying is he's saying, don't be fooled by who your foe is. Understand who your foe is. The one behind it all. The one behind the sin of the world. The one behind your temptations. The one behind trying to get you to slip and fall and lose the battle. 
and lose battle after battle after battle is simply Satan and his demonic forces. You can never lose sight of that. Men, it's not your wife. Ladies, it's not your husband either. Although it can seem like that at times. Just ask my lovely wife down here. It's not our boss at work. Although it can seem like that. that feel like that at times. And not that Satan may not use people in our lives to try and trip us up, but we need to understand who is behind it all. And it is Satan and his demonic force. Let me just say a couple more things about him. Satan has many names. Let me just name a few of them. Probably the most common is the one I've used several times already, Satan, which simply means adversary. And he is the adversary of God. Another common name for him is the devil or slanderer. Jesus describes him in John chapter 8, verse 44, as the father of lies and a murderer. Now jump up to verse 11 of Ephesians. And, 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 and let's read that verse. And here's what it says. Put on the whole armor of God. Hold that thought. We'll come to that here in just a moment. But let's look at the second part of that verse. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. It's very important. They, it, this word's very important to look at. It's important for us not only to realize who our foe is as we strive to glorify God with our lives and live in obedience to him and in close fellowship. Not only is it important that we understand who our foe is, but it's important that we understand how he attacks. And the Bible says here that he uses schemes. And the Greek word that Paul uses here for this word schemes, or some of your translations might say wiles, the Greek word here is methodeia. And it carries the idea of deceitful strategy. Deceitful strategy. Satan, does not, Satan will not come and shoot from the hip with you and me. He will not come against this church just shooting from the hip or just doing something off the cuff, okay? He, he, will, he, 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 he never attacks, according to God's word. He will not attack with just a non-thought-out plan and just attack and just hope things pan out, Okay? That's not going to be the way it happens. He will put together a thought-out strategy that he believes with all of his heart will work and will trip you and I up and get us to, and, and, and get us to sin and lose the battle. That's what he will do. And we have to be ready for that. Now, I have always enjoyed, those of you that know me uh, pretty well, I, I, I have always enjoyed the sport of hunting and I've enjoyed it ever since I was a little kid. Um, and some of, your, some of you men in this room know what I'm about to talk about. We didn't, uh, back whenever I was younger and, and a younger man in my teenage years, we didn't do a lot of stand hunting, you know, like a lot of people do today. I came from a big family. My dad had, had 12 brothers and sisters, so there was a lot of family. And we would get together in what we would call a gang. There'd be about 25 of us. Now, everybody can understand this that if you just walk through the woods, kind of just meozy in your way through, um, carrying a gun and, 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 and hoping to get a deer, is it possible to get a deer that way? Yeah, it is. All right, some of you said no. And honestly, you're pretty much right, all right? You have to get pretty lucky um, if you want to just meozy your way through. And you know, you kind of know where you're going, but you don't really have a strategy to it. You could run into a deer. You might get lucky that way. But we found, and a lot of you guys have found this true to me too, we found that if we got together in a group and we strategized, we could be a whole lot more successful. And what we would do, there'd be about 25 of us, and we love to do, to, to do what you call deer drives and push off a ridge and hunt deer that way. What we would do, I'll just go through this real fast, what we would do is we would send about five or six guys out to the end, and they would line it up, and we called those guys the watchmen. And they would line the ridge so that they could cover it and so that no deer could go running through. The rest of us, this is what I would do most of the time, we'd stand back and we would, make a, we would stand on the other end of the ridge and we'd form a perfect line and we would walk in a perfect line and do our best to try and push the deer towards the watchmen out there. And we had a strategy. We would try our best to stay in a perfect line. That way you would always know where everybody was and so you could shoot in a safe direction. If, like if a deer was here, I could shoot. I could shoot here. I could not shoot if they were here. We would always try and stay in a straight line. If, if we'd run into some thick brush or whatever, and I couldn't see the guys, we'd let out a little holler, like, woo! And they'd yell back at me, woo, okay, there they are, all right, good, all right, all right let's keep moving. And we'd try and push the deer towards the watchman. Something else, and this is what the big bucks would try and do, they would try oftentimes to 
to, they, they'd run out ahead of us and they'd try and scoot out the sides before they'd make it to the watchmen out there. And you know, they, they, this is what the big buck would do a lot. And this is why this was always the, the position that everybody was fighting over. Um, so what we would do is we'd put two flank men down here. They would be on both ends of the drive and they would walk out about 150 yards out in front of the drive and they'd stay there to try and catch any deer that were trying to do this number. And so these guys would have to be like, all right, now I know he's right there, and so I can't shoot this way, but I can shoot over here. Some of you are like, this is getting complicated. You guys are taking your life into your own hands. Well, maybe a little bit, but you've got to keep life exciting. No, not really. Um, but, we were able to be very, but we were able to be very successful doing that. Why? Because we had a strategy. We knew what we were doing going in. And, here, and, and, and here's the whole point to this. Satan knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. He knows about you. He knows about me. And when he attacks, he attacks with a strategic plan for you and for me. We have to keep that in mind. We must keep that in mind. And we must be strong in the Lord, because apart from the power of his might, there is no hope for us in the battle. As we try, as we serve the Lord, as we glorify his name, we must be strong in the Lord. Let's get to how we do that in verses 11. You know, let's read verse 11 again. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Go down to verse 13, and he says it again. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. How are we strong in the Lord? One of the key ways, we must put on the armor of God. We must put on the armor of God. Keep in mind that it's all in the Lord's strength. It's not my armor. It's God's armor. It says that for a reason. And every battle that I have victory over, it's not because of me. It's because I stood strong in the Lord and in the power of his might by wearing the armor of God. Let's look at this armor of God. The armor of God. Number one, the belt of truth. And verse 14, follow along with me. Yeah, just the beginning of verse 14. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. Now, what Paul probably had in mind here whenever he's talking about this belt he probably saw soldiers wearing these, is, is, is kind of what a lot of commentators are, are in agreement on. He, would pre he, he, he probably saw this. Now, this belt was not really part of the armor that, this, that, that, that the soldiers would wear back then. It was a belt that was kind of like an apron-like thing, and it would cover from about here, kind of down, it, 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 down to about here on the legs. And they would strap that tight. Now, it, and, and, and now, the, the word that he uses here for truth is the word aletheia. And the context here, it carries the idea of being committed to the one true God and being, commit, and being truly committed not only to the one true God, but to the truth of the one true God. Does that make sense? That's what this carries the idea of. It's almost like God is giving a pep talk up here. And I'm a soldier in, in the army of God. I've sat and, and I'm sitting down hearing the pep talk of God. And he's trying to get his soldiers ready for the army that's, gonna, that, that's about ready to come over the hill. And saying how we have to fight against this army. They're coming and we have to be ready to fight. And he's giving the pep talk. And all of a sudden, me as a soldier, it's like I stand up and I say, yes. I will commit myself to this. Because you are the one true God. You are the God of truth. Everything that you have ever said is true. You are the creator of all things. You are the only way of salvation. You are the truth. You are the life. You are the God of truth. And I will commit myself. And this is what the soldiers would do whenever they commit themselves. The first thing that they would do is they'd strap on that belt. This is the belt of truth. I will commit myself to standing for the truth of God and fighting for it. That is the belt of of truth. Let me ask you something. Are you committed to the truth of God? Have you committed yourself to that? To putting on the belt that God has given you and me? The belt of truth. Have you committed yourself to that? Or are you willing to let truth slide just a little bit? Maybe just to keep the peace. Okay, maybe just so you don't make too many waves. Are you willing to give up on the truth? Let me say this. If that is what we do, 
then we are not committed to the truth of God. We do not have that belt on. We are not ready for the battle. The battle is over before it even starts. We must be committed to the truth. We must stand strong in the Lord and in the power of His might by strapping on that belt of truth. That is the belt of truth. Number two is the breastplate of righteousness. And verse number 14, the last part of verse number 14 says, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, this breastplate that the soldiers would wear back in these days, it was often a two-sided thing. It often, like it often covered the front, and, they, and, and there was often a back piece. And, a court, and, and, and according to research, what they would often do is they'd often un, actually attach it to the belt that they wore that we just talked about. They'd attach it so that it, to, just to keep it from moving all over the place, to keep it firmly put in place, okay? And, it was obvi- and, and this breastplate of righteousness was obviously there to protect their, their uh, um, insides, their, uh, their uh, heart and uh, their internal organs. That's what I'm trying to say. But that's what it was there to do, obviously. Now, this, uh, now, whenever, uh, now, whenever the Apostle Paul calls it the breastplate of righteousness, now this is God's breastplate that he's given to you and me. Now here's, now here's what he doesn't mean. He doesn't mean, he's not talking about the righteousness that we are given whenever we become Christians, okay? He's not talking about the imputed righteousness of God. Whenever I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior, I am made righteous before God. That's not what he's talking about here. We're, remember, we're talking about standing in the fight. Now that's what this whole passage is about. What he is speaking of here is he's speaking of being right with God, having a right relationship with God, walking in close fellowship with God. That is what he speaks of when he says we need to put on the breastplate of righteousness, being right with God. How am I not right with God? How do I, how, how, how do I take the breastplate of righteousness off? It's very simple. Unconfessed sin. That's how I take the breastplate of righteousness off. This, this is difficult. This is very difficult because this takes a humility from you and me to keep this breastplate of righteousness on. To say, to say the seven hardest words in the English language, whenever you put them together, I believe they are the seven hardest words, to actually say this. To say, to, to say I was wrong. Will you forgive me? Everyone turn to your neighbor and say those words right now. Go ahead. (laughs) Say, you didn't even do anything to have to do that, and it still rubbed you the wrong way, didn't it? (laughs) Sure, it rubs us the wrong way because because we are not naturally humble people, and it takes the strength of God in our lives, being strong in the Lord, to walk in a way that is humble before him, and whenever we sin against him, whenever we fall, to come and actually say, and, and by the way, let me just get on my high horse here for a second, the, the, and, 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 and this is not in the Bible, but I'm going to say it anyway, um, the, 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 the whole thing about I'm just sorry, oh, oh, I'm sorry, that is a cop-out as far as I'm concerned. Anybody can say that. And anybody can say that just to get it over, and I'm sorry, okay, let's just move on. No, 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 no. I was wrong. I did it wrong. Will you please forgive me and have a heart like that towards the Lord Jesus Christ? That is what the breastplate of righteousness is. We must stand strong in the Lord and not in my own strength. Whenever I have unconfessed sin, I stand in my own strength. We must not do that. We must put on the breastplate of righteousness. Number three, shoes. Everyone have a good pair of shoes on? I heard a guy say one time, and I believe it with all my heart, he said, you need to invest your money in three things. <laughs> tires that your car, it, it, t- excuse me, tires on your car, the, the, the mattress you sleep on, and shoes, because you are always on one of them. And I believe that with all my heart. <laughs> but verse number 15 says, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Now, the shoe that, Paul, that, that, that more than likely Paul has in mind, here was the battle shoe back then. It was a shoe that wrapped around the foot and was able to be tied very, very tightly to the soldier's foot. 
And not only was it very tight, and by the way, it, and, 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 and you all know as well as I do, that whenever you tie something tight like that, it gives you somewhat of stability. And not only was it tight, but, it w- but, but they would normally have little pieces of metal sticking out of the bottom, kind of like the cleats were that the athletes wear today. <laughs> okay? and, it, and, and, and it was simply so that they would give the soldier a sure footing. A sure footing. That way, whenever the battle would come, they would not be easily moved. If they were bumped, if they were pushed, if the sword was swung, whatever the case might be, they would stand firm with those shoes on. They would not be easily moved if a charge came. That was the shoe that Paul was probably referring to here. The whole context, let's remember this, the whole context here is standing strong in the Lord and being victorious whenever, the, whenever Satan brings the battle to our doorstep. This is what it is. Standing strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. There's a lot of people that get this one just a little bit wrong, these shoes. And Paul is not speaking about going and proclaiming the gospel. Although, let me say this, that is obviously a biblical truth. And we do need to go into all the world and, ple- and, 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 and preach the gospel to every creature, okay? That is obviously a biblical truth. But that's not what Paul is saying here. What Paul is saying here is, as we are in the battle, we need to have our battle shoes on. And we need to be able to stand firm, and you can stand firm, in the gospel. The gospel is how you stand firm. I feel so bad for so many people that go through this struggle, that that allow doubts of their salvation to creep in. When, when God is so true in his word about his love for us and how, and, and, what if we, and when we realize we're a sinner and admit that and call upon his name to save us, that he will do that. But they allow doubts of their salvation to creep into their heart. And, and, and not that it makes them any less of a Christian. They are still a Christian in the family of God and in the army of God. But here's what happens. They take their battle shoes off. And then when, and, and, and they think things like this, oh man, is that really true? Did God really do it all? I mean, that, that was all it took, what he did for me on the cross. How, that doesn't make sense. I'm told a lot of other things other than that. How, how can I know that that's true? Or God could never forgive me for what I've done. Or man, I sinned against the Lord and it was a sin in a big way. How do I know that he didn't cast me out of his family for that? And these doubts can creep into our hearts. We need to stand on the truth of God's word. We need to stand in the power of God and claim the verses Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one may boast. Romans 5, 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have, what is it? Peace. The, the, the gospel of peace. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. John 6, 36. All that the Father gives to me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will in no wise cast out. These are the battle shoes. These are the battle shoes. Whenever I am standing firm in the gospel, whenever the, say, uh, uh, when the battle comes, to, uh, uh, comes my way, I am not easily moved. I am not easily moved because I stand in the gospel. I have faith in what God says, that he saved me. And when he saved me, I, he, he made perfect peace with me. I am at peace with God. I am on the right side. I am on the winning side. And he will in no wise ever cast me out no matter what. And, through, and, and, and with that knowledge, I stand. Stand in the gospel. Not my gospel, but God's gospel. Stand strong in the Lord and in the power of of his might. That is the shoes. That's the shoes of the gospel of peace. Next, the shield of faith. In all circumstances, verse number 16, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. We all know what a shield is. We all know that the soldiers back then often carried a shield into battle. And it was close hand-to-hand combat a lot of times, and shields came in really, really handy to deflect blows of swords or of spears, or if an arrow was shot, they they, they could block that with their shield. And Paul says, take up the shield of faith that God has given you as a great resource. Let me tell you what this shield of faith is. What Paul is 
what Paul is speaking about is my belief in God. My belief in what God says. I have faith in what he says. When he says something, I say, Lord, I believe you. Lord, I believe you. I believe you. I believe you. Whatever he says, because we know that it is the truth, we say, I believe you. What these fiery darts are that he talks about, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, they are fiery darts of temptation with which Satan will try to get a soldier of God to not believe something about God and instead to believe something about what Satan says. I'm going to take my jacket off here as soon as I put this back on. There we go. So I don't pass out. But the shield of faith. I believe you, God. I have faith in everything that you say. I will never forget when it happened five months ago. And I don't talk about this hardly at all. But when it happened five months ago that the Lord took our children home to be with him. And I want to tell you something. Satan knows when to attack you. And he attacks with a scheme. And he attacks with a plan. And I will never forget, as I went through that, and I knew, in the back of my mind, I knew that it was wrong and that I was feeling the wrong way. But I've shared this with several people, that there, there, was, there was a dart fired at me. And, I, and, and it was almost like I could hear the voice in the back of my head, is God really good? Is God really good? What goodness could possibly come out of that? Does God really love you? Does God really love your children? He just left them die. Some of you ladies and, and, and men know what I'm talking about. Some of you have been through things like this and other things like it. But that's what was going on. And that was a battle. That was a big battle. And let me tell you what happened. I, I was sitting at home. And, I, and I, was, I was just struggling. And I would turn to the scripture. And I, would, and, and I started looking up the verses where it talked about the goodness of God. Where God would tell me that he is good. And that he works all things together for them who love him, for the eternal good of those who love him. And it was almost as if, I didn't hear an audible voice, but it was almost as if I could hear the other voice over here. Saying, Aaron, do you believe me? Do you believe me whenever I say I'm good? You don't have to know everything. You don't have to understand why all the time. But do you believe me when I say that I am good and I am good all the time? And that I am sovereign and that I work all things together for your good in my master plan. Do you believe me? And I'll never forget whenever I, it, you know, it went only through his strength. I was able to pull my shield up and say, yes, I do believe you. As hard as it may be, I do believe you. And you bring your shield up. We go through circumstances. And some of them are detrimental. Some of them are hard. And that's why the Apostle Paul says, in every circumstance, Take up the shield of faith where which you can quench all of the fiery darts of the evil one. That is standing in the strength of God, in the shield that he has given you and me. We must stand strong in the Lord. Take up the shield of faith. Now in our last verse, verse number 17, we'll move on here. And he says, and take the helmet of salvation. And Paul reveals what he has in mind with the helmet of salvation in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 8, where we read this. Now, you don't have to turn there. Let me read it for you. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, here's what it is, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. After what I just talked about, let me tell you something. And, and, and you probably are all thinking about different things that you've gone through where you've had to pull the shield of faith up. Here it is. Listen to me. The war, the battle can get long. And the battle can get wearisome. 
And we can think to ourselves sometimes as we go through things and as we're trying to hold our shields there, we're trying to stand our ground and we're trying to stand on truth and glorify the name of God as Satan bombards us with different things and we're trying to stand there, we can start to think, oh my lands, is this ever going to end? How in the world am I going to stand for this for a long period of time? Here's what Paul says. You must put the helmet of salvation on. This is the helmet that God has given you. It's an encouragement to you that there is a day coming whenever he will come back and this, and, and this fight will all be over. He will come back. He will receive you to himself as a soldier in his army. He will win the last battle and we will forever spend eternity with the God that we are working so hard to glorify. That is the encouragement here with the helmet of salvation. We can encourage ourselves in that truth of God. Stand strong in the Lord and in the power of his might by putting on the helmet of salvation. And now the last one, and this is where we'll end today. The sword of the spirit. Now I want you to please listen closely as I share some very important truths about this weapon, the sword of the spirit. The Greek word that Paul uses here for sword is the word makara. Now, this is not the kind of sword that you might think of whenever you think of the word sword, okay? Um, whenever you and I think of the word sword, we probably think of a movie that we've watched where these guys have these great big swords, and you know they're four or five feet long, they're probably about that big, they have to swing it with both hands. These guys are muscled up and muscular, and they still have to swing it with both hands. And, and it's a kind of a sword that if you're in a battle, play, to kind of fight in hand-to-hand -hand combat, you, you could kind of swing it and, and not really swing at anything and maybe get lucky. You're just the same, okay? Um, that's not the sword that Paul is speaking of here. The makara, and by the way, we know that this was a sword that was used back then because in Matthew chapter 26, verse 47, this is the same sword, the, the, the same word is used here for the soldiers who came to arrest Jesus in the garden. They were carrying the same sword with them. Same word is used. Um, how, however, the makara... Here's, here's what it was. It was simply, most of the time it was a two-edged blade. It was a two-edged blade, but it was only anywhere from 6 to 18 inches long. It wasn't a big sword. And that is very important because I believe there is a message there with that. The soldier, if he was carrying this sword, he couldn't just swing it and hope he was going to get lucky. He had to know what he was doing. And he had to be precise with it whenever he would use it. He would probably have to practice with it. I don't know what that practice may have looked like. I don't know if he had a shield and, 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 and he would practice blocking a guy and coming inside. I don't know if that was a practice. And you know how they do that in the movies? Every good guy does this in a war movie that's hand-to-hand that, that's -hand count, but it's always the good guy. The, the, the sword will come and they'll block it with their shield. They'll block spin. And that, that'll happen every, in, in every know what they were doing. I just broke my microphone. <laughs> there we go. But they had to know what they were doing. That's the bottom line. They had to know how to use this sword. Now, the word, uh, now, now whenever he says, and the sword of the spirit, which by the way, who, where, uh, where, where does our sword come from? Who gave us it? God did. The Holy Spirit. That's where it comes from. The sword of the spirit which is the word of God. Now, the word, that, now understand what I'm saying. The, word, the Greek word that Paul uses for the word word here in this text is the Greek word rima, of which simply means a specific statement. It means a specific statement. Paul isn't referring here to a broad range of understanding of the scriptures, although, that does, although we need to have that. We need to know what the whole scripture says. But that is not what he's referring to here. He is referring to a specific statement. What he means is, when you find yourself in the battle against Satan and his forces, you must know what the word of God says specifically for your specific situation. That is the truth that Paul is driving home here. You have to know what the word of God says specifically for your specific situation, whatever temptation the sa Satan is coming against you with, you have to know what the Word of God says about that in order to be able to fight well and stand strong in the Word of God. Now, I want to just do a quick illustration here. And 
Uh, Mr. Hargrove, would you come up here for me for just a second? Thank you. All right. All right. All right, let's come down here. Now, you are going to play, if you want, would you play the part of Satan? Thank you. You've been practicing. I knew, you were, I, I, I knew you'd turn red, yeah. but, which is why I, okay. All right. All right. Now, now, here's, now, let, now I just want to go through a scenario. I thought of this, and it just helped me put, it, 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 it just helped me personally understand what Paul means by this in, in, in just a little bit better way, so I thought I'd do it. He, 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 here for you. Now hold, now hold on. Hold on. Now, now I, yeah, yeah, now let's just play this scenario out, okay? Now I have gone through, I'm a soldier in the army of God. I have just gone through something tragic, okay? Something has happened to me in a tragic way, and you know when to pick the battle. So you come, and you're going to say, and, 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 and you're going to get me... <laughs> <laughs> All right. You want to get me to qu- you're going to try and get me to question the love of God. That's the yeah, that that's the the battle that you're going to bring to me. Question uh, get me to question if God really does love me because of what he has allowed to happen in my life. Now, here is what Paul means whenever he uses the word rema uh, w- with this sword doing specific statements to help get victorious in the battle. Okay, here we go. Go ahead. All right, I'm going to block oh. that. Yeah, I'm going to block that. Then I'm going to come and I'm going to do this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only... All right. Oh, oh. oh man. And just like that, it's broke. <laughs> Thank you very much. Give him a hand. Thank you. And another one that would work really well with that is, is, is in the book of James. It says, hey, like... W- w- what does it say about temptations? Whenever trials come my way, it says what? Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, for you know that the trying of your faith worketh what? Patience. You know God is at work. These are the, these are the specific statements that you can call on from the Word of God that will help in the battle against Satan. We, we must know the specific statements. The verse... Um, the, the verse, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's a great verse. That's a true verse. It's in the word of God. It's a great verse. However, whenever I am being bombarded with, try, uh, with Satan in the battle, trying to get me to question the love of God, that verse doesn't go very far. It's not the specific statement from God that I need at that time. And that's what Paul is saying here. We must know how. We must know the word of God in this way. Do you know the Word of God? Do you know the Word of God? uh, Jesus did this so well. When He was here on earth, whenever Satan came to tempt Him. By the way, in Psalm 119, verse 11, it says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not, what? Sin against God. This is how you do battle with Satan in the strength of God. In the strength of God's words, not in the strength of my words. I must not think that I'm witty enough to win the battle. I must not think that I and myself am smart enough to win the battle against Satan. I am not. I will fail. It is only through the power of the word of God that I can prevail in the victory. Jesus did this wonderfully. In Matthew chapter 4, yeah. let me just read a couple of things here from, the, uh, from that story. This is Satan. If you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Satan again, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Specific statements that directly, that, 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 that were directly a part of the situation he was in. And he said to him, all these, this is Satan again, all these I will give you if you will fall down 
and worship me. Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Do you know the word of God? We need to know the word of God so we may use it in his power to win the victory when the battle comes. As we strive to glorify God and to live our lives in obedience to him and walk in close fellowship with him, we must know the word of God. We must stand in the strength of the Lord. Please, everyone, bow your heads. Let me ask you all a question. How are you doing in this spiritual war? The spiritual war is here. And as we strive to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, to walk in close fellowship, to live in obedience, and to glorify his name, the battle will come. Are you ready? Do you have all of the armor of God on? Or did God point out a piece maybe this morning and said to you, hey, you've taken that one off. And it's time to put it back on. As the piano plays, I just want to ask, I'm not going to call you forward, but I just want to ask you, if the Lord spoke to your heart about that today, would you just, right where you're at, would you just lift your hand up real quick just so I can see you? Let me pray for you. Thank you very, very much. Hands all over. I'm going to pray for you here in just a minute. But right before I do that, maybe you would say to yourself, you, you know, this God that you talked about this morning, I don't know that I'm on his side. I don't know that I've ever received him as my savior and joined his army. I just want to ask, right before we pray, and in this time of invitation, I just want to ask, is there anyone in here that would say, I don't think I know Jesus Christ as my Savior, and I want to, and I'd like to right now. Would you just lift your hand? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm just going to let the piano play. And if you raised your hand, if you'd like to come forward and talk to somebody, I just, I'm, I'm going to let just, a, I'm going to take this on just for a minute. And if you'd like to respond that way, I'd ask you to come forward. And if the counselors would be ready, please. Our kind Heavenly Father, we love you so much. We thank you for giving us the resources when we entered into your family. Thank you, first of all, for accepting us. And Father, I just want to ask that you would give us strength to stand strong in you, to put on this armor that you have given us, your resources to us, your gifts to us, so that whenever the battle comes, we may be able to stand strong in you. Give us courage. Give us wisdom. Give us the ability to do just this. We praise your name for the work you've done in hearts today. Father, I do just want to ask for those that raise their hands. Would you just show them where they need to change? Thank you, for, thank you so much for their humility and being willing to raise their hands and saying, yes, the Lord spoke to my heart. I need to make a little change. Father, thank you for them. What a wonderful thing. I want to ask that you, I just want to uplift each one of them and ask you to do a work in their hearts and change them and make them more like you. And Father, do us, Father, do that for all of us, I pray. And Father, there was one who raised their hand for that, that person knows that they need to be saved. And dear Lord, uh, 
They didn't come forward, and that's okay. That is quite all right. But would you just continue to draw near to that person? Draw near to them. Let them know that you love them so much and that the angels are waiting to rejoice if they will but say yes to you in your salvation. I pray for that person. May you, may you indeed have your perfect way with them. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.